Welcome to the Ad Astra podcast. Today we have with us Patricia Nava. Welcome. Welcome, Patricia. <laughs> Patricia is an independent researcher. She has done a lot of research in the history of astrology, particularly in 17th century uh, authors and also in Katarkit astrology and the history of Katarkit astrology. Um, she has a background on literature and philosopher, has her major and her main studies. Uh, so, Patricia, welcome again, and um, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your work, please. Yes, um, as you said very well uh, before, I, my studies are in philosophy and literature, but uh, I have always had a, a special interest in observational astro astronomy and in the history of astronomy as well. My interest in the history of astrology came later, in fact, I met uh, Giuseppe Bezza, uh, oh. who was a scholar in the field of the history of astrology and uh, taught for a couple of years at the University of uh, Bologna. And uh, as I have a background in Germanic philology, it was quite natural for me to uh, take up the translations of, of uh, my favorite author, that is uh, William Lilly, especially his uh, uh, treaties in three volumes, Christian astrology. So I would say that my um, special field of research is especially the history of catarchic astrology in general, horary astrology in particular, but I am also very interested in the uh, relationship between astronomy and astrology, especially during the early modern period. I mean, uh, the astrology made by the astronomers. There are some very interesting examples of this and uh, I found it fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, oh, please. <laughs> uh, so um, this, this is a very uh, interesting topic. So the, 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 the astronomy made by, by astro uh, astrologers. So the astro uh, sorry. astrology, made, the astrology by astronomers. made by astronomers. Mm -hmm. So that relation between someone who is a a scholar and a practitioner of astronomy and someone who studies and this is a time where astronomy is really moving along and, and gaining a completely new status but still we have most of these large figures which are also astrologers uh, and the attitude was different during the time i mean uh, we find some astronomers such as tico brahe who really believed in what he did as an astrologer there are other astronomers who um, made use of, of for example even of cathartic astrology in uh, in their work but without being so fond of it and um, it is quite interesting to see, historically speaking, this development during the centuries. Um, and also to see the persistence of Katarkic astrology during the centuries. I mean, uh, when we speak of Katarkic astrology, we generally think of uh, somewhat that could seem a primitive form of astrology, because it is uh, sometimes related to uh, to magic, uh, to uh, other fields of that kind, uh, uh, talismanic magic in particular. But, uh, well, uh, it is also true that during the early modern period, a lot of scientists, and when I use this term, I mean in the modern common sense, uh, made use of cathartic practices in order to assure uh, the positive outcome of uh, their uh, scientific institutions. For example, to found their astronomical observatories. Tycho Brahe was one of them. Uh, when he founded his astronomical observatory of uh, Raniborg, for example, he uh, produced uh, a, an electional chart for, uh, for the right moment uh, to lay the, the, the first stone of his observatory, and he believed completely in this practice. He was really convinced, convinced of it. And what is interesting is that in um, 
in the election chart for that moment, we can find almost uh, the same, not exactly the same positions, but the same principles applied. We can see, for example, in uh, the foundation chart of Baghdad, a lot of centuries oh, yes. So it was very, very traditional. For example, the position and the importance of a star such as Regulus, Mm -hmm. uh, or um, a strong Jupiter and the Ascendant. So, uh, the same principles were applied. Then, uh, well, during the centuries, this uh, changed, of course. Another astronomer, John Flamsteed, who was a great admirer of uh, Tycho Brahe, decided mm -hmm. to use Katakic astrology to uh, create an electional chart for his astronomical observatory, the Royal Observatory of Greenwich. Yes, <laughs> and uh, their attitude was different, of course, uh, because, uh, mm, for example, John Flamsteed was not so sure that uh, astrology had some truth in many cases and in many situations. But he also said in his diaries that the impression of the stars, I'm quoting, roughly, okay? The, um, the impression of the stars were so um, potently imprinted in the soul of human beings that it was impossible to deny any kind of uh, influence on the part of the stars. So we decided to, to <laughs> make use of the selectional chart in any case. Mm -hmm. The attitude, of course, is different, but it is interesting to see how Katakic practices persisted even in, uh, in the following centuries, in the modern era. Yeah. The persistence of a practice, even in different uh, scientific contexts? Yes, and, um, even in different scientific contexts. And yes. in different, uh, in different um, mindsets, yeah. so with different mentalities, but still. And uh, I'm curious about this. Uh, I have seen, I think we have seen, I've never seen the, the, the election for Uraniborg, but I have seen for uh, the uh, observatory, I think. Yes, I think so. Uh, did he follow the traditional rules or did he just do something, I mean, for the observatory of Greenwich? Yes, I think he followed uh, the traditional rules uh, and also the presence of stars, for example, if I remember well, uh, there is a speaker, a very beneficent star, exactly at the mid heaven uh, and there are other features that are very similar to the election by Tycho Brahe. Okay. So I think that Tycho Brahe was a somewhat a model for him. Okay. He tried to, in his own way of course, with, with, uh, with differences, to imitate, to emulate this, okay. this great observer and astrologer. Okay. So there are some traditional features in that chart as well, yes. Yeah. So the, the rules also persist, even in different times, in different contexts, yeah. but they, they would follow, they would uh, root their practices in this, yeah. uh, in this tradition. And that, that is... Yeah, that's yeah. Really good. and I suspect uh, in my own researches, which are within this time frame that, that you, you were talking, uh, I believe that a lot of buildings might have had similar elections, although we, don't, we no longer have the record of those, uh, those are, because when I find ceremonies described, and usually there's always a, a ceremony of the first stone, sometimes uh, associated with a mass or, or a blessing or some, some kind of more reli standard religious um, uh, activity. And uh, usually the times are very precise, sometimes a little odd. and you can always suspect that there might have been something yes. else other than <laughs> just the <a> religious. <laughs> yeah. And especially uh, after the Great Fire of London in 1666, mm -hmm. uh, the reconstruction of the city, of the important monuments, of course, not of common houses, was based on uh, this kind of uh, elections. Mm -hmm. so there are some records. Uh, sometimes it is not um, easy to to have the right data, but we understand there is something. There is an election. Yeah, Th that would be a great research to to, yeah. to spot all the all yeah. the monuments that were reconstructed with elections, it and to build like a map. Yeah. 
Yeah. Something that you can do. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? A research idea yeah, for the future. Yeah, that would be a great, a great project. Yeah. And uh, also, we are talking about founding cities and also for buildings, important buildings. But also, and I found this very interesting because I had um, an example of this in the text that I studied in my PhD. And also, I, then I found another example. Elections for praying to God. I mean, like um, the, like the, the, the priest... Uh, advising uh, a noble woman to pray only when the head of the dragon was in the mid heaven because that would be the moment where God would be more receptive God and the saints would be more receptive to the to the prayer so this is something um, not only astrology um, mixing with uh, what we now call science but also co 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 living living together peacefully with mm -hmm. religion that is that is so interesting because it it would apply in several aspects of life yes even very common aspects of life but in fact if we look at even ancient texts about Catholic astrology, Dorotheus of Sidon, for example, or the uh, medieval uh, books about this, we often find very uh, specific prescriptions for very common happenings. I mean, um, cutting one's own hair wow. or taking a bath or <laughs> yes. very simple situations. And this is quite yeah. amusing and interesting, I think. Yes, yes. it was part of, of, of common life, mm -hmm. everyday life. Yeah. Yes, from the most important events to uh, very basic common events, mm -hmm. or even they would go so far as uh, elections for um, conceiving a child. A male child or a female child? I would love to see if that works. <laughs> we never know. Or sometimes the opposite. Or for not conceiving, not a, conceiving child. a child. So uh, it's yeah. like contraceptive. Yeah, contraceptive <laughs> uh, election, <laughs> which is quite... That would be for every aspect. It was a useful practice, we could say. It was seen as a very useful practice. Every everyday life, and not only... Uh, yes. of course, there, was, there is the important side the noble side of it, foundation of cities, uh, mm -hmm. foundation of monuments, or any kind of uh, important happening uh, like that. But there was also something else for common people, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Everyday yes. life and for, for yes. people that had less important tasks, but they were important for them. And also what we found in um, geography is that uh, most um, cities, and I think it's the same in Italy, they have one sign or two signs associated. So could be something related also uh, to, to this kind of um, to this kind of election. An ancient election that something made that in was memory. lost. Yeah. Perhaps. In Italy very often there is a connection between charts, electional charts, probably foundation charts, that are not always uh, uh, real charts, I think. I mean, uh, we, we quite often uh, find out that, that they are ideal charts for that city and they not always correspond with what archaeology can tell us. But um, there is a branch in archaeology that is quite interesting as well, uh, that is to try to uh, date uh, um, the ruins of, uh, of of cities, so the foundation of cities and, uh, and monuments by means of astronomical or even astrological considerations. Mm -hmm. So we, also that one could be a very interesting mm -hmm. uh, research. <laughs> I mean, just yeah, that would be a great project. Also. Yes, yes, indeed, indeed. We found out uh, that, uh, for example, Elena worked with a collection of charts uh, in her PhD on um, several notable figures of France, uh, 15th century France. Yes. And then one thing that we noticed is that most of the times there are there is doubt on the date of birth or the year of birth because historically we don't have, there's no precise records. And then we find a chart uh, 
<laughs> and the chart in a similar way it can help us data city some astronomical observation or some astrological data uh, also a chart of a person that appears in the collection can also clarify exactly uh, what was the, what is the date of birth for, for that figure and sometimes um, the place sometimes yeah. they don't know where the 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 the, the, ch the child was born uh, i mean within france but in which city for instance and there we have we can see from the chart yeah. Where, where the birth well, dates can can tell you so yeah. dates and uh, and uh, places. Yeah, and so it's quite quite quite. A, it's a it's a, a use of astrology in For astrological history. data in historical reconstruction uh, of events. I think it's that's also a, a wonderful branch to to explore to with all the data we we all well, the data we have. And I, I was wanting to ask you. So you have centered, of course, also due to your studies, um, more on uh, William Lilly and uh, the English yeah. astrology of, of, of that of this period. But um, do you have you found equivalent practices in in Italy, for example, or other places uh, which you have focused on? Or well, of course, there are some uh, very famous. Uh, Italian astrologers who practiced the uh, same kind of astrology, I mean Katakic astrology, or uh, not only election, electional, but also horary astrology in particular. For example, uh, Vito Bonatti. Uh, Vito Bonatti is one of the main sources of, of uh, Lily. Lily had uh, some books uh, in his very rich uh, library and uh, we can find uh, uh, very often uh, not exactly quotations from uh, from uh, uh, Bonatti but uh, the same words the same sentences reworded in uh, in some way and we can see how Bonatti was actually important in forming Lily's practice mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we see even that Lily departs from his favorite template for our questions, that is to attribute the first house to the quarant mm -hmm. and the seventh house to the quasited person, in order to be faithful to Bonatti's uh, opinion. For mm -hmm. example, when Lily says that uh, when a woman is uh, exposed from the house of uh, her husband, mm -hmm. if she can return or not, and so on, then the seventh house represents the exposed partner, the exposed woman, mm -hmm. even when the woman is the quarant of the question. Ah. So he's going against his own beliefs, mm -hmm. his own real concrete practice of every day. Mm -hmm. And we can, uh, we can find this in, uh, in Bonatti's work in uh, Dutch and Continents, Liber Gastronomia. Mm -hmm. so, uh, we have uh, evidence of this, but uh, this I think is quite interesting. Um, some astrologers, even practicing astrologers, have uh, uh, found out that Lily is not always consistent in his use of houses. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he makes use of, of this that I said is his favorite template. First mm -hmm. house is always the quarant, seventh house is the quasited person or, or the quasited thing, or any other house fit for purpose according to the nature of the person asked about or the thing asked about. But this is his template mm -hmm. and he is quite consistent in the use of it, generally speaking. But sometimes he shifts to a different use to the use of uh, the first house for the person quasited mm -hmm. or the thing requested. Mm -hmm. And this is quite puzzling sometimes because it happens inside the same chapters about the same topic in paragraphs that are very similar the one to the other. So we wonder why this change. Mm -hmm. But I think that the reason for this is historical is not a technical reason. I mean, I respect the practicing astrologers who try to find a rationale in, in this uh, shifting of, of houses and mm -hmm. try to be um, faithful to Lily in using the first house in this case and the seventh house in the other. But I don't, I don't think that this is completely 
satisfactory because mm -hmm. I think that the real reason is, as I said before, historical mm -hmm. and comes from the historical transformation of inceptional and electional material mm -hmm. into questions properly called, especially in the course of the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we can see this passage, if, if we think, for example, of Dorotheus of Sidon, I, I mean, uh, I'm mainly interested in early modern practices, as I said before. But it is true that astrology is a very traditional um, discipline, so it's impossible to study Lily, for example, or any kind of later author properly without studying at the same time the sources, and the sources are in the past. So, for example, the Theos of Sidon is an important source for Lily as well. Mm -hmm. Although, to be sure, Lily, of course, never mentions Dorotheus. There is no Carmen in his library because there was no complete translation into Latin or no extant uh, tradition at the time, uh, if ever existed, I don't think so, in any case. But there is a, a, an indirect transmission of Dorothean material we can find in Christian ast astrology, of course, by means of medieval authors, especially Arabic authors, mm -hmm. such as Sahal bin Bishr, both for questions and elections, or uh, Abu Ali al-Kayat, especially for native material, or even, uh, or even through Bonatti, or mm -hmm. Ali, Aben Rajel, for example, that is a very important source yes. for the yes. Sometimes literal. Continuously, yes, literal. Uh, sometimes Lily makes mistakes because he quotes from an edition he possessed mm -hmm. of Ali Aben Rajel that contained some mistakes and he reproduces them, although they are not present in other editions of previous editions of Ali Aben Rajel, for example. Mm -hmm. So we have evidence of this process of almost copying. Yes. Uh, from uh, from uh, some works. Yes. So, uh, through these authors, we have an indirect uh, influence of Dorotheus of Sidon, even on Christian astrology. For example, just I give just an example. Um, the choice of significators in questions about relationships and marriage. Mm -hmm. Well, Lily says, for the man who is the querent, you have to use the first house, the lord of the first house, a natural significator for all men that is the sun, and the planet from which the moon is separating. For the woman, quasi it, you have to use the seventh house, uh, the lord of the, of the seventh house, a general significator that is Venus in this case, and uh, the planet to which the moon is applying. Well, these words are present in common astrological theories of Poseidon, so they are exactly the same. Of course, Lily couldn't read those words in that work, but they are present in Bonatti as well. They are mm -hmm. present in Sahal bin Bishr as mm -hmm. well. So, by means of other medieval authors, uh, Dorothean material or Dorothean like material mm -hmm. came into the practice even of early modern authors, later authors such as Lillian. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. We, 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 we always have this opinion, and as, as you read more sources and, and we explore sources, that there is indeed. How shall I put this? A nucleus of practices and concepts that yeah. remains a core that remains practically constant since earlier authors like Dorotheos until very late authors like like William Lilly, and you can you can follow a, a thread uh, um, into them and you connect them yeah. like, like you, you you are stating, and, and that becomes very clear. And then you have extras or specific practices 
that vary. That vary a little bit from the from this core, but there is a like, central core yeah. that we can more or less follow throughout the millennia. Or even yeah. if it's not specifically a technique, we can follow the idea. The concept is there. Sometimes expressed in a way, sometimes expressed in another form, but the concept is there. Mm -hmm. It travels. If, if we can, if we read enough authors and uh, we can abstract a little bit the idea from the literal meaning, we see that the, the, these concepts actually travel, as you said, yeah. throughout time and they remain more or less unchanged. And then the, the way they, they are applied changes throughout uh, different um, places, cultures, uh, and um, periods. But the concept, it's there mm -hmm. and remains there. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we are very invested in doing. This is what we study, the history of concepts throughout time. And um, it is so interesting to see this, mm -hmm. because I, I always say it's like having, the, the concept is like having the same face, but uh, throughout time it has different makeups. <laughs> yes. ways of, different ways of expressing itself. But yeah. you can see through the makeup and you can see that it's there, it's still there. So it's so interesting. Uh, but um, you, uh, you are not only studying Lily, you are also translating Lily. Yes, I would like. Yeah, so please, can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> um, yes, I am translating is uh, Christian astrology. I'm publishing it uh, with uh, uh, Agora. Uh, into I'm Italian. translating it into Italian. Into Italian. I think it is an important work. I think it is, of course. Because uh, there was no such a translation in Italy. There was uh, before only a translation of the modified uh, and uh, um, chained, completely chained version of Zadkiel Morrison from the uh, 19th century. And um, even in the astrological world, uh, they they generally think that that is Lily, but it is not so. Uh, the original by Lily is completely different, and the principles are, are uh, mostly different, and uh, some, a lot of details are different, and not only the details. So I decided to translate uh, the original, and I'm comparing the two different editions, because there are only two uh, editions of uh, Christian astrology that were authorized by Lily himself. Mm -hmm. One is uh, um, uh, of uh, 1647 um, and the other of 1659. Then there is this edition mm -hmm. of the 19th century by Morrison that is, of course, amended, as he said, ameliorated, as he said, uh, really modified, deprived, I think. And uh, I'm comparing all the three, these three editions in order to have a, a clearer picture mm -hmm. of, of the original on one side and of the transmission mm -hmm. of it by means of other astrologers of, of uh, the following centuries who uh, modified a lot of techniques in order to uh, produce something that was more palatable, I think, for a Victorian audience. Mm -hmm. so, so this passage could be uh, interesting to, to, to examine. Yes, yes. Uh... But, uh, what, I, what I think it is really fascinating, um, from my point of view, mm -hmm. of uh, historical research in this field is that Historical research can help you understand the techniques mm -hmm. and can give you the reason why some techniques are there, even when they are a bit puzzling, as I said before, mm -hmm. about the use of different houses in the same context, after all. And at the same time, the presence of certain techniques in certain works can give you um, evidence of the transmission, historical transmission. So it is a twofold influence, uh, study 
of history on my side and the study of the techniques, I think that they must go together. It is necessary. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yes. <laughs> absolutely. Yes. 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 Undoubtedly. Um, and I think what uh, makes William Lilly's work so important well once away it's simple it's it's in english so it's something that has a much it's much easier to read for the modern researcher you don't need to go into a, a language that that you have to study and to really know to in order to access it uh, of course that's probably the first uh, but but it's also i think um he has this as you were saying this transmission of many sources uh, from Arabic and earlier one that come with the Arabic and he does this uh, preservation and synthesis yeah. of sources which are make him I think uh, at the same level as a treatise of like Bonatis or a treatise like Sal uh, it has that kind of consistency in a period where you will find that most treatises, and this I'm, I'm coming out from, from my research, which is centered on the Iberian world and also a little bit of Italy, where the practice was already a lot of, there were a lot of changes and, and strictures being applied to the practice. So, and for example, so Arabic sources were no longer used exactly. or accepted at as much. At least openly, openly. At least, oh yeah, at least openly. Mm -hmm. And Lily doesn't have that problem. He's, he's, making a concise uh, manual, uh, following up as much of the tradition as he, he, he has absorbed and, and decided to transmit, while in other places you already see a more poor version, if we can use this word, of the tradition more because depleted, uh, depleted of, yeah. of all this quantity and, and richness of content because there has already been censorship, there is um, a uh, filtering of Arabic sources in some some cases, and it doesn't have the same power, I think, uh, as uh, Lily's work has, and it's not as complete mm -hmm. as Lily, Lily's work is. Okay, it is, it is very relevant to, to do this, and I, I I think you had already translated the two first parts. Yes. So you mean the introduction, and then the big chunk on uh, Horary. That's the, the big part. So you need now to go for nativities. Mm, yes. <laughs> but the, the big one is the second one, isn't it? Yes, the second yeah. one. It is yes. that. <laughs> All the examples uh, and so on. It is, um, it is interesting to, uh, as I said before, try to find uh, why translating a rationale for for his, for his choices, and very often you can find it uh, in, uh, in past sources, actually. Uh, I don't know if it is really a choice on the part of Lily. Very often it is a simply uh, faithfulness to the tradition or respect, rather, for the tradition, mm -hmm. although he is always able to say what he really thinks, after all. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, for example, even in his attitude uh, towards uh, Ptolemy, we can find uh, this uh, double attitude, perhaps. I, I, I think that uh, certainly the so-called back to Ptolemy movement or of the Renaissance influenced uh, Lily as well. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in, for example, in, uh, um, in Almanac of 1644, um, mm -hmm. it is England's uh, prophetic Merlin of 1644, he states that his aim in uh, writing Christian astrology and then publishing it, is to make some pieces of Ptolemy speak English. So there is this respect uh, towards uh, Ptolemy, of course, and also when he has to uh, make a choice between different uh, techniques, mm -hmm. he generally stands by Ptolemy, for example, uh, the calculation of the part of fortune, that is the Ptolemaic one, and not the Hermetic one, not the Dorothean one, or uh, uh, the choice of uh, Ptolemaic bounds instead of Egyptian bounds. Mm -hmm. Or, for example, he doesn't use Dorothean triplicities, but the simplified version of mm -hmm. Ptolemy. Mm -hmm. This is true, but it is also true I, I think, this is my opinion, mm -hmm. that we should not overdo 
this influence uh, by Ptolemy because after all Lily seems to be very faithful to traditional authors but he's quite an independent figure after all. He states uh, um, in a very direct way in the same almanac he says that um, it is not important for him if Ptolemy was against horary astrology. He defends his practice of horary against Ptolemy's indifference. In fact, Ptolemy didn't speak about uh, uh, horary astrology, of course, in his, uh, in his uh, treatise uh, Etrabibulos. But he says that there are two possible answers to this problem, two possible solutions, says Lily in the Talmanach. Uh, he says, one is, if the Centiloquium was actually written by Ptolemy, then the problem is solved because a lot of aphorisms in the Centiloquium are devised for horary questions. But if, and here he is very aware of the problem, I think, if the Centiloquium was not written by Ptolemy, then this doesn't matter because <laughs> horary astrology is a practice that works because Ptolemy is in the past, I am in the present, astrology has developed in the meanwhile, so there is no reason to disregard or to discard horary astrology only because Ptolemy was against it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even in his third book, Christian astrology about nativities. Here we can see the Ptolemaic influence more clearly. Of course, Ptolemy is one of his main sources for that third book and almost only for that third book, actually. But he says, probably my readers will accuse me of um, criticizing Ptolemy or disregarding his uh, teaching. And I admit, I'm doing this. I'm departing from Ptolemy, he said, because I think um, it is more important to rely on reason and experience rather than experience of a single man. And he also adds, I'm not the first astrologer to do so, so to depart from Ptolemy, and I will not be the last one. So he's quite independent after all. Mm -hmm. He respects very highly the traditional sources, but when he has doubts about something, he states it very, very clearly and mm -hmm. directly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. yes, he has critical thought. Yes. And yeah. uh, also, um, he had experience, extensive practical experience, so he, he relies also in his own practice and his own experience yeah. that's that's very interesting yeah. yes. and these two things can can um, coexist the respect for the tradition and then his experience so the one thing does not um, take out the other just they coexist that that is a that is yeah. a very interesting yeah. thing yeah. another yes. thing it is very clear is that he has well, we were talking about there are all these changes, and he he, he uses uh, the Ptolemaic Ptolemy calculus for the part of fortune, Ptolemaic bounds. But I think that's a, a result of the practice of his time, because he, he was already living at a time where you have at least one century, if not a little bit more, of a complete change in the way that the, the, the essential dignities were, were, were experienced, all this return to Ptolemy was quite embedded at this practice. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. so he's quite um, using a line uh, of work which is modern and he's, is contemporary to him or a, a little bit or, or one or two generations before him. So that is the continue, the natural continuation. But then, as you were saying, he adds a lot of other more traditional sources to it, which is not as common, for example, in um, uh, other 17th century books or even 16th century books mm -hmm. where they, they, they're, they're doing their own thing and, and he's already he's quoting a lot of Arabic tradition. Uh, so it's a bit like a second wave. It's, yeah. say, a sort of a second wave if we can say it like this where other traditional elements, older traditional are again coming into to, to, to his work uh, while other others don't do that. Mm -hmm. Well, th th this is why it's so interesting. 
it, this is why it's so interesting that we can study the techniques throughout time mm -hmm. because we see how they develop and how they uh, change and sometimes return. So that, that is the interesting part. Well, I look forward for your uh, work and for uh, your last uh, last part, last section of the translation. And of course, the next thing I'm going to say is, uh, will you translate the almanacs? <laughs> because it comes like in a natural mm -hmm. sequence. <laughs> Mm, there are some of them that are quite interesting, but they also they are also full of material that perhaps is a bit uh, difficult to propose uh, to to the public, mm -hmm. uh, if not an academic public, because they are less consistent. In, in I mean, they, they speak about. Uh, several very different topics in each almanac so but um, it it could be it's an idea project <laughs> this as well yes <laughs> thank you for the suggestion <laughs> <laughs> well it's always uh, he has a lot of good material there i think uh not perhaps not all almanacs but i think he has uh, a lot of mundane, for example, material in the almanacs, which he doesn't deal with in Christian astrology and can perhaps complement. It's uh, very yeah. revealing and it's also revealing about his views, more personal views. And maybe that would be the way to go, like uh, to see a William, and, a William Lilly and his context, political, cultural, mm -hmm. maybe, I don't know. Exactly. Well, uh, I think that uh, the only practice that is somewhat lacking in his work is the election practice. Mm. And this is quite strange if you consider that, uh, uh, after all, horary astrology uh, was a later development of electional and uh, catarchic astrology and uh, uh, inceptional astrology. But uh, there is a reason for this. For example, in uh, Christian astrology, he says he has not the slightest intention to deal with electional astrology. But not because it is not valid, but because he thinks that any clever astrologer who studied his work thoroughly would be able to produce <laughs> any kind of electional chart um, about any kind of subject with no problem at all. And this is interesting because he seems to be aware of one historical fact that although electional astrology and horary astrology have completely different purposes, of course, because one uh, aims at uh, solving a specific question, a specific problem in uh, understanding or foreseeing the possible outcome of a situation and the other instead is searching for the most auspicious moment for uh, an enterprise, any kind of action. At the same time, as far as the techniques and the principles involved are concerned, they are, according to Lilia Trees, actually the same. Mm -hmm. So he treats them as if they were the same. And this is probably due to his experience, not to his uh, historical awareness. Mm -hmm. But it is quite fascinating, I think, to find that this connection, this kinship between these different practices is real and uh, historical. Uh, we can find evidence of this. That's very interesting. Like two faces of the same coin for him. Yeah phases of the same kind mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. yeah and uh, i i also like i like to see the the book and the almanacs because you see different facets of lily mm -hmm. and there uh, is more uh, i would say is more revealing in the almanacs but also in the book we can see especially in certain uh, examples we can see his political views and uh, his views toward religion and we can see him in the book also so it is it is interesting mm -hmm. i hope that some editor will uh, find this interesting because that would be also a very good project mm -hmm. be a very yes. good really? <laughs> let's see <laughs> mm -hmm. well um
Patricia, thank you very much for sharing uh, all of this with us. I think uh, you're doing a very interesting work because not only the translation, but the translation is also allowing you to really understand where the lineage of thinking that goes into this work is coming from. And I think that's highly valuable in such a work. And I think because you're translating, you're, you have to be very aware of this fine detail. It's not the same as reading it. It's, 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 it, you have to really go into it. So, so it's, it's giving you a lot of good information. And I, I, hope, uh, I hope you can also publish later perhaps papers on, on this kind of approach and on this analysis, which I think is also quite interesting. Uh, for such an important author, at least, uh, in terms of posi the positioning uh, of astrology at this period, because I think he's almost our last example of a complete uh, practitioner, uh, practitioner yeah. at this point. Yeah, he's a very so, late example. Yeah, so, so we, there are others, of course, uh, but he is uh, a central <laughs> player in, in this in this period. Um, yeah. So I, I hope you, 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 you will be able also to, to address that, those details in, in, in specific papers. And I thank you very much. We yes, thank you thank very you. much for, for joining very us. very interesting. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for this opportunity to <laughs> talk about very interesting things, I think. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yes. And uh, we hope to uh, talk again soon. Yes. Why not? Yes. Why not? Thank you. <laughs>